Public outrage in the UK is growing after more fresh claims of phone hacking by the News of the World newspaper. What are the ethical boundaries for tabloid newspapers in the UK? And what does it all mean for the future of the media industry as a whole globally? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. Britain's leading Sunday tabloid has come under fire amid claims that journalists were involved in phone hacking. The News of the World is accused of illegally gaining access to the phone numbers and some voicemail boxes of up to 3,000 people deemed to be of public interest. On Thursday, the scandal deepened as it emerged relatives of military personnel and murdered schoolgirl Millie Dowler were also targeted. Lawrence Lee has more. Another day at Rupert Murdoch's media empire, another public relations catastrophe. Never mind advertisers pulling away in disgust at reporters hacking the phones of murder victims. Now it's suggested the News of the World newspaper was intercepting the phones of families of soldiers killed in action in Iraq or Afghanistan. The News of the World had been campaigning on behalf of soldiers with the Royal British Legion. So guess what they and soldiers' families think now? We work, obviously, with families, bereaved families, in a great deal of detail about um, how their loved ones died and going through the inquest procedure, etc. And we feel that given the sensitivities of that, uh, it would be just inappropriate for us to be working uh, with News of the World, given the nature of these allegations. And we've decided, therefore, to suspend our working with them until the inquiries have taken place. It follows a week of claims like victims of the London bombings having their phones tapped and the families of children killed by paedophiles. In terms of morality, the big question is, just where is the bottom? Astonishing allegations of this kind, claims that police officers have taken bribes from journalists, aren't just an absolute gift to opponents of Rupert Murdoch's enormous media empire. They also raise quite profound questions about issues to do with British democracy, the idea of the rule of law in this country, the idea that Britain has some of the best press standards anywhere in the world, start to be called into question. The only comparable event in recent times here was the MP's expenses affair, a huge scandal which involved politicians being accused of fraud and some sent to jail. Anti-corruption campaigners say it all gives a sense of Britain not practising what it preaches to other countries. But I think what this whole sad episode reveals is that there is a certain degree of complacency about corruption in the UK. We have recently completed an in-depth study of that issue and we have found that the problem is far more serious than is commonly accepted. And there are some particularly serious issues in certain sectors. As of now, the government, whose Prime Minister has close links to the newspaper group, and the police, themselves accused of bribery, are the people carrying out the investigation. For all the expressions of shock, they will secretly wish it would all go away, but the rest of the media won't let it. Lawrence Lee for Inside Story. An inside story, of course, isn't letting it go away. I'm joined by my three guests in Doha, in Qatar. Jan Kulin, he's the general director of the Doha Centre for Media Freedom. Welcome. In Cambridge, England, Stephen Murdoch, University of Cambridge Computer Laboratory. And in London, Martin Bentham, Home Affairs Editor for the Evening Standard. Gentlemen, thanks very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. Uh, Martin, can I come to you first? Uh, you, you write in one of London's, if not in London's largest evening newspaper. The UK espouses uh, the comments of, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of expression. How far now has the British media got to, you might say, a turning point in the way that they news gather and the techniques they use to gather that news? Um, I think there is a very definite turning point has been reached. Clearly, freedom should come with some responsibility. I do think most of the media, uh, print, broadcast and so on, exercise that responsibility. But clearly, there are some who don't and who haven't been. And they have been exposed quite horrendously in the last uh, week or so. Uh, clearly, this is a long running saga, but the, the revelations of the last few days are particularly serious and severe. 
of course, uh, watching what's going on in the UK, it would be understandable, Jan Kulin, in, in Doha, to perhaps appreciate that somebody maybe in Far East Asia or South America really wouldn't be bothered by what's going on in the UK. So what's the significance for people and for media organisations in other countries? Well, I think it is significant, uh, and we don't have to go to Latin America. We can stay in this region, in the Middle East, where there is actually a struggle going on for democracy and for press freedom. So now those people, those governments and other people who are against you know, more press freedom can say, look, uh, what happens if you have a free press? Uh, you know, uh, journalists are... Um, kind of behaving unethically and so we have to prevent these kind of practices. So I think it might have uh, far-reaching consequences in that sense. Indeed. Well, let's go over to, to Stephen Murdoch. Uh, and you're no relation, of course, to Rupert Murdoch, Stephen. We have to make that very clear. Uh, but just give us an idea about what this phone hacking scenario really is. People are hearing the phrase phone hacking and a bit confused about how a mobile phone or a, or a home phone line on a landline can be hacked? So in a way, uh, phone hacking is a misnomer. It's not hacking the phone. Um, actually, mobile phones have quite a lot of good security. It's hacking the voicemail, and this is a much weaker aspect of the phones. Um, here, someone, a private investigator, could um, find out the customer's phone number and then call the same line that that customer would use to collect their voicemail. The investigator would somehow guess the PIN. Maybe it's just left as the same one that was given to every customer, or maybe it's set to the date of birth or something else the investigator knows, and then they can listen to all the voicemails. I mean, how, 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 simply, how simple is it to, to get a PIN number? I mean, we get PIN numbers with our credit cards and we're told to guard them with our life. Why is it that people are perhaps a little bit lax when it comes to the phone line? Well, I think one aspect is that the phone companies at least used to be quite lax in how they dealt with them. So while banks would always give every customer um, a randomly generated PIN, that's not the case with mobile phone companies. They would give every customer the same PIN until that customer changed it themselves. And that gave investigators a very easy way to get into these phone systems. Mm. Martin, let me come over back to you now, of course. Um, it's one thing to snoop on politicians and celebrities, those that are perhaps you know, elected to power and, and have, a, have a, 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 a right, a need to answer to the public. Celebrities, of course, perhaps want the publicity. Why is the UK public, and this is what we're hearing, totally disgusted by the way that these particular instances have come to light? Well, I think actually the former inc incidents were also wrong. Clearly, they were uh, potentially illegal from what we know. Uh, but, but what the difference is, is that, as you said, the people who are rich, famous and so on in the public eye, there's some sense, not in relation to committing crimes against them, but that they are um, in the media eye, they, they deserve some um, exposure potentially. Um, clearly it's very different when people are just ordinary members of the public and particularly when they've suffered some horrendous thing like a bereavement either at war or indeed through a murder or anything of that sort. That's clearly an altogether different uh, level of person, they're in a very different situation, they're very vulnerable. Um, I think any person, whether they're a some other member of the public, a journalist like myself, would feel very disturbed at thinking that they were being taken advantage of in that way and that their privacy was being invaded in that way. Is that reflected gl globally, Jan? What, how do other countries deal with exposure like this uh, and these sorts of instances? Are there any precedents? Um, well, I, I, I think the British uh, media, you know, they are a case in itself. I, I, I'm from the Netherlands myself and I've noticed very often, you know, there's a big difference actually between the British uh, tabloids and a newspaper like the Telegraaf uh, we have in the Netherlands, which is also um, a bit, you know, like the news of the world. but. When it comes to unethical news gathering, uh, I think, you know, they behave much uh, better. 
But the strange thing is that countries, you know, like Britain and also like the United States, they are like an example for the world. So in that sense, uh, I think what happened here is, well, it, it, it's like giving a very bad example. Mm -hmm. And there's always, I think, a tension between privacy and freedom of expression. I mean, in some cases, as an as a investigative journalist, okay, you have to to, to go on a terrain which is, you know, sometimes difficult to defend, but you can defend it because you're serving the public good. You, 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 you think the public has the right to know and they have to know. So, um, but in the case of the British, uh, of this news of the world and some of the other British uh, tabloids, I even think it has nothing to do with journalism. Okay, well, Stephen, let me bring you in here. It's an internal inquiry, and I'll ask all my guests this question, actually, but Stephen, let me come to you first. Uh, do you think an internal inquiry by uh, News Corp in, or in, into the uh, Murdoch's international, uh, News International is actually going to be enough, uh, even though, of course, there is great pressure on the Prime Minister uh, for an independent judicial inquiry? Well, I think one of the more damaging allegations has not been as much that um, there's been phone tapping, but that law enforcement and maybe even the, the court systems weren't dealing with these properly. And I think that when you have freedom of press in a country, people will overstep those boundaries, um, but there has to be a, an open and public investigation of those, and that can restore confidence in the justice system, and it can also control the press in a way that preserves freedom of speech, yet rules out some of the more egregious abuses. Uh, let me go over to Martin Bentham in London. Is it as easy to say that the or News International can actually clear its own house up and set itself on the right track again. It seems there's a great deal of pressure on them to act, as well as the fact now that we're hearing that the police are investigating, perhaps themselves, for helping journalists get that information. A great deal of pressure on the Prime Minister as well. Yes, well, I think it's difficult for um, News International to... News International can clearly hand over as much information as they've got. I think they are now fully cooperating with the police and doing that. Um, so, but I don't think they can just draw a line on it by hanging a few of the journalists concerned out to dry. There is obviously a big question about Rebecca Brooks, the chief executive, and indeed further up the chain even. Uh, James Murdoch has been in the sights of some uh, parliamentarians. Um, so far as the police go, clearly that's another almost separate issue altogether, the payments, um, that's even more serious almost. Um, the, the Metropolitan Police are investigating it themselves at the moment. I think that will be difficult to sustain. And the Prime Minister on top of that has clearly got links with News International. His, his appointment of Andy Coulson, the former editor of the News of the World, is looking increasingly uh, questionable. And there will be questions potentially at the end of this, depending on what the outcome is, about his judgment. How important is it for the Prime Minister then to go for an independent judicial inquiry and have it headed by what would be perceived as a very strong judge? I think it's absolutely essential and I think if he doesn't do that um, the, the problem will not be solved in any shape or form. There will just be some sense, there'll be accusations that the thing hasn't been done properly, that it's been um, too sympathetic and, and so on and there will be continuing demands for somebody of gr who can be absolutely clearly seen to be independent to conduct this inquiry. I don't think it's sustainable at all to avoid that. Jan Kulin in Doha, I mean, the media uh, and journalism, print media, television, it's, it's not a bed of roses. It, it's a tough cutthroat business. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, you know, over the years, uh, from your perspective, how much pressure is there on journalists to get the story in the field? And what sort of pressure is applied from high above? Yeah, I think there is a lot of pressure uh, uh, normally. I mean, especially uh, when it comes to investigative journalism, to good journalism. Uh, you know, there's pressure from, from governments. Sometimes there is pressure from religious leaders or business interests, from politicians. 
there is there is actually uh, there is pressure all the time, and I think you know when I read about this British case, of course now it came to a big scandal and people are calling, rightly so, for an inquiry. But uh, what call what drew my attention, you know, to the British co uh, case is also the lack of an efficient uh, press complaint commission. So the British public, uh, I mean, there, there were complaints before. Uh, it's not the first time. News of the World and other tabloids, you know, are accused of these uh, of, of these uh, practices. But it's often seen as a toothless organisation, the uh, the Press Complaints Commission, uh, when the public go and, and and want redress for something that they feel uh, is untrue or, yes. or they want redress on it. If I just bring in uh, Martin uh, Stephen, sorry, uh, in Cambridge. I mean, what's your impression of how these? organizations that are supposed to uphold uh, the public's independent right to object, how do they actually behave and, and do they really have any power at all in, in a media that seems to have gone into the internet ether? Yeah, so in general in the UK it's very common for industries to decide to self-regulate and in exchange, they will hopefully avoid some more heavy-handed legislation. But this can only work when the regulator has teeth and is willing to use strong sanctions against the people who violate these rules. Yet there's been repeated allegations that the Press Complaints Commission um, don't have the ability to actually control the press. And I think this is a, a topic that needs to be investigated and perhaps more powers given to the Press Complaints Commission or a new body should be formed that is going to enforce um, good standards on the press. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin, let me come over to, I mean, Jan's agreeing with that, but let me come over to Martin because this now brings in a, a, another issue of privacy laws. Uh, uh, Martin, how concerned are you that the calls now from perhaps MPs even or even the public will become louder about privacy calls, uh, privacy law, sorry, uh, because every time it's muted in the public, in the press, in Parliament, it seems to get knocked down. I think the difficulty is, it's all very well talking about regulation, but what regulation are we talking about? Max Mosley, for instance, was recently uh, going to court trying to argue that there should be pre-notification of all stories to the subject of those stories. Now, that doesn't necessarily work. It might sound fair in theory, but actually quite often it won't work because somebody can potentially put an injunction on it for a start of. Secondly, ruin the story by giving it to, to rival competitors, which is perhaps a less important point, or use other ways in which they can suppress it. And it's very, and actually another factor in that is that uh, clearly newspapers are competitive, as indeed the broadcast media are. They rely on being able to break uh, news stories, genuine investigations. Uh, regulation of that sort, for example, would be quite harmful. So whilst it's possible to say that regulation should be tightened, I think there then has to be a very clear debate about what that regulation should be, because there are some people who want to have very strict rules on the, the press, the broadcasters and so on, and I'm not sure that would be entirely healthy for democracy either. It well, goes back to one of the comments earlier on, in fact. Indeed. And I would also say, incidentally, that the Press Complaints Commission, although it, it is not perfect, many journalists, including myself, I've never been referred to it, touch wood, and I would not want to be, and most of us regard a referral to it actually is quite a serious business and we don't adopt it, uh, think of it as a, something that can just be approached with a cavalier fashion. Yeah, yeah. Jan, you're nodding in agreement. Do you want to come well, in here? Yeah, I wanted to say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, saying that it's not a serious uh, institution, but it's, it should get more teeth and it should be able, uh, you know, to, to call for sanctions and it should be able also to uh, require compensation, for instance, uh, and that goes also for the case we are discussing uh, today. And I think such an institute should, should be democratic, sh should be with the representation of uh, the journalistic profession, mm. of the journalists and of the public at large. Also, you know, it's very old-fashioned that the public 
doesn't have any voice in this. The public should have somehow, you know, there should be a mechanism mm. to give the public, public a say in all this. And that's so important, I think, for press freedom in the rest of the world, because all of us, we are looking at what's happening uh, in the UK and what's you know, it gives journalism a very, very bad name. And if, let's say, the sector, the media sector in the UK is not able to resolve this in, in, in a good way, it, it will have uh, negative uh, repercussions. Well, it, some would say that the, actually the British media sector is you nearly sure? becoming controlled by one individual, uh, Martin, uh, uh, that being Rupert Murdoch. If I just quote from uh, some of the comments that have been made, Chris Bryant, a Labour member of Parliament, saying we have let one man have far too much sway over our national life. Zach Goldsmith, a Conservative MP, saying it's a systematic abuse of almost unprecedented power. Uh, it has systematically corrupted the police and, in my view, has gelded this parliament, his, his talk of Rupert Murdoch's relationship with the government. And Nicola Soames, a very senior Conservative figure, saying that the government should intervene to delay or even stop Mr Murdoch's plan to acquire all the shares of B Sky B. It's another uh, big financial uh, coup for News International if they take over the big satellite arm uh, that covers the satellite broadcasting within the United Kingdom. Martin, you know, the focus really is now on Rupert Murdoch, his relationship with really the British public and British politicians as to how his organisation is going to conduct itself. Um, very much so. I mean, there are about three issues that have all come into one here. Media plurality is, is a very big issue, clearly. I don't think, actually, that the fact that the news of the world has behaved in this way is necessarily related to the fact that it's a, that it's a paper um, that's owned by a, a very big group. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily, it has to be the case, a big group could operate very, um, in, with very good standards and so on. It so happens that in this case it hasn't, which obviously makes it more, more concerning for those who are critical of the Murdoch empire, um, if his uh, empire is about to, uh, to expand. I think also clearly those links between the Murdoch empire and the government, and indeed the previous governments, clearly are going to come under massive scrutiny now with the B Sky B bid still uh, to be decided upon by Jeremy Hunt, the Culture Secretary, and it seems increasingly difficult actually for the government to, to wave that through. They've already delayed it today uh, until September or September, October time, and I think again there will be enormous pressure to, to halt that. And indeed Ofcom, the organisation that, that regulates the media, certainly saying that they're going to keep a very close eye on things. Uh, Stephen, can I come to you? Uh, in terms of what's going on with the Murdoch Empire and certainly how people are reacting to the news of the world, we now are hearing that big organisations are, are withdrawing their advertising. We're seeing Ford Cars, Virgin Holidays, the Halifax Bank, uh, several others um, dissociating themselves, even a call to uh, abstain from buying the newspaper which comes out on, on a Sunday. The only precedence we've ever had with that before is again another newspaper in the same group called The Sun that insulted Liverpool football fans at a football match that many died at um, incorrectly and people in fact in Liverpool many still don't buy that newspaper. Are we going to see the same sort of thing happen here? I think it's going to be quite difficult to say based on how the story pans out. Um, a lot of the people who are previously advertising in News of the World and who are deciding not to now um, will be continually evaluating the situation. And if people start to forget about the story, then they might start to consider advertising again. Um, but if the story is going to run and run, if there's going to be investigations and there's going to be further allegations surfacing, then I think many advertisers just wouldn't want to deal with the potential bad press they are they will get if they are seen associating with news of the world. Uh, Jan, can I come to you perhaps for our, our final word? We're looking, sorry, uh, I'll come to you in a moment, Stephen, very quickly it, it, as well. Okay. Uh, Jan, globally, uh, we're looking at print media here. People can now get their news on the internet. Is it so important? I think it is, because I don't think it's about print journalism or online journalism. It's about journalism. It's about journalistic practices. It's, a, it's about how you go about uh, your profession and it's about journalistic ethics. So I, I think it is a very uh, important issue. Okay, Martin, very quickly, we are coming to the end of the programme. I would like to bring you in on your final comment. 
I was just going to say that actually the public do have a, a vote, both in, in, funny enough, not in regulation directly, but they very much have a vote in terms of whether they buy the paper or not. And clearly there's been massive uh, image damage to the news of the world. If that is sustained, if people actually don't read it, um, then that will, and the, the advertisers think that the public don't want to um, be associated with that as well, and them to be associated with it, then that will be catastrophic for the news of the world. That will force change. The public can actually force change this way. Well, we shall see what does happen. This story is not going away. To all of my guests, Jan Kulin in Doha, Stephen Murdoch in Cambridge, and Martin Bentham in London. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me on this edition of Inside Story, and thank you for watching Inside Story. We do like to hear your suggestions and comments for future editions of the programme. Email us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. I'm Sahil Rahman. Until next time, do take care. Bye-bye.